and it's talking about mining. It's kind of a strange thing. It, he t Job talks about mining for precious metals, and uh, but the ultimate jewel, he says, is wisdom. This is something that cannot be mined for like gold or diamonds. This is something that humans can dig for and try, but they can't find it. This is what he spends 14 verses talking about. <laughs> so verse 15 to 22, he kind of catalogs all the earth's treasures and lists how wisdom is not among them because humans can't find it. Um, and then he continues and, and finishes this by saying, only God knows the way to wisdom. Wisdom cannot be mined the same way gold or any other precious thing can. Gold can, or wisdom can only be found through God. And as he says, he says, Truly the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to, to depart from evil is understanding. When he says this, he's kind of referring to what his friends have been telling him the whole time, that you must have done something wrong, repent to God, and this will all be gone. Everything will be just as it was before. And so this final line here is, is literally a quote from Ecclesiastes, um, or not Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, I'm sorry, but uh, this is the ancient Hebrew understanding of wisdom. To have wisdom is to fear God and to seek understanding through that fear. Any questions so far on, on 28? a poem. It's kind of the same form as the speech cycles have been, but it's a little different too, and that's what we're going to spend some time talking about. There's a refrain verse in here that's really important. Job asks twice in similar words, almost, almost identical. He says, where shall wisdom be found, and where is the place of understanding? Could be. I would say um, I would say that's a summary statement of ancient Israel's view of wisdom. Um, like I said, it, it's almost a direct quote from Proverbs. Um, this is the ancient view of, of wisdom: is the only way to God possesses all wisdom. The only way to ever even come close to attaining it is to do your best to fear God, to obey God's commandments, um, and see what wisdom comes from that. Um, I would say the key verse is this question that he asked twice. Where shall wisdom be found and where is the place of understanding? Um, Job kind of, it, it doesn't have the same kind of lament feel that his speeches do. It, it's more of a pondering, I would say. And he's reflecting on, I want this wisdom stuff. Where do I find it? And he eventually says that only God has it. There's no way of finding it. Now, there's these twin pillars here I want to talk about. You see this, this refrain verse twice. Where does wisdom come from? Where shall wisdom be found? Where is the place of understanding? Wisdom, understanding. Understanding, wisdom. There are these two pillars that Job is seeking. Um, and like I said, this is poetry. So the Hebrew is important, not just for uh, an excuse for me to be nerdy with you all for a little bit. But if you look at the... I put the transliteration of the Hebrew on there. Hokmah is the word for wisdom. Y'all say that with me. Hokmah. Then say uh, understanding with me. Bina. Hokmah. Bina. Anyone recognize anything from those words just from hearing them? Poetically? They rhyme. So, so think of... Um, I won't give you any more of the Hebrew for the sake of our class. <laughs> but think of saying, where shall Hokmah be found? And where is the place of Bina? Hokmah, Bina. They're rhyming. They're, they're um, not just pillars together in terms of meaning and significance, but they rhyme. Uh, it, it really shows the, it gives you just the taste of what the original Hebrew poetry looked like. Um, and these two words are very significant. Like I said, wisdom is a big deal to, to ancient Israel. And Job, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, these were like the, and, and Psalms are like the three, 
are the, the main wisdom books of the Old Testament. Um, and Israelites really ponder this question of wisdom. What does it mean to have wisdom? Uh, in Proverbs, uh, wisdom is actually personified as a woman. They, they call her Lady Wisdom. She's this person who can mediate between humans and the divine to kind of settle the scores. It doesn't sound like Job trying to settle the scores between humanity and God. Um, Job doesn't talk about wisdom that way, which I find interesting. But. Yeah, yeah. And then when you think ahead to John, to John 1, um, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The, the word, the, to say word, was very similar to saying wisdom. Um, logos, word, is, um, has that kind of connotation of wisdom as well. So, so Jesus being the wisdom of God made flesh uh, in one person. But let's talk about what these words mean a little bit. I'm going to give you very simple definitions. They're, these are very dense words that like books and books and books have been written on them. But to understand wisdom and understanding together, wisdom is a general reference to knowledge. Uh, knowing something, uh, just to know something. While understanding meant discerning the implications of that knowledge. Um, Richard told me that kind of seems flip-flop from what we think of wisdom and understanding today. So wisdom being knowing something, whereas understanding is discerning what it means to know that. Is that confusing? Yeah, <laughs> yeah the wisdom stuff is, is not a... That's a great reference to, to this poem. That, that's basically what, what Job ends up saying at the end is, is uh, verse 28, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. To, it's almost a fear of wisdom as well as fearing the Lord. Um, and, and true wisdom only comes through God. It doesn't come from you seeking it out yourself. True wisdom comes from, from knowing God, knowing God, following God's commandments. Does that make, make sense So you? You're, you're echoing the, the kind of traditional Hebrew way of thinking about wisdom, um, which Job affirms, and at other times I think he's questioning. This, this refrain verse kind of seems to question that a little bit. Um, but this is a little bit of a cryptic part, Jim. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, Jim. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, understanding only comes through wisdom. Yeah, it's that's uh, very well said. Um, so, what do these terms mean for Job? Why do you think he's asking for for wisdom and understanding, or, or seeking it at least? What does he hope to know, and what does he hope that this knowledge will afford him, given his circumstance? Anyone have a guess or an idea? There, there is no one right answer to this, by the way. This is just us thinking out loud before we go any further to see um, why Job is, is kind of doing this. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a great way of thinking about it. Um, reason why he might be seeking understanding, seeking wisdom, um, as, hope, as hope for uh, a return to his former life.
so, so you think Job is looking at wisdom as a way out, maybe? Possibly. To God. Okay. I like that. That's good. Others before we move on? Peace and resolution. Okay, so wisdom is peace. We have a lot. We have a good scattering of. Go ahead. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Others. Yeah, the, so the, the wisdom, wisdom for the why do bad things happen to good people um, question. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Well, let's, let's move on. Keep those ideas in your minds as we go through and see how they kind of play out because I think a lot of these are, are referred to, a lot of these ideas of um, what, why Job is seeking wisdom and understanding. They, you'll see these in the next couple of chapters. So keep an eye out for what he said. So we get to this verse. We're still on 28. We get to this verse 22, um, and Job refers to this Abaddon. What on earth is an Abaddon? Here's verse 22. Abaddon and death say, we have heard a rumor of it with our ears. Uh, let, let's read 20 to 22. Where does then does wisdom come from, and where is the place of understanding? It is hidden from the eyes of all living, and concealed from the birds of the air. Abaddon and death say, we have heard a rumor of it with our ears. Anyone ever heard of Abaddon before? Ina? Distra oh, that's that's a uh, that's not one uh, something I had in my notes. That's that's a good way of thinking about it. So, so distraction and death say, that's great. Distraction and death say, that's that's a good way of thinking about it. We have heard a rumor with our ears. Um, Abaddon is uh, sometimes is personified as like a monster. Uh, this right here is Abaddon, on the left. Um, and he's, he's with Mammon, which is God of this world and personification of wealth. And the thing on the right is um, Ashtaroth, who is a demon. So you have Abaddon, who, who we're not saying exactly who it is yet. Um, Mammon, God of this world uh, of wealth. Um, and then we have Ashtaroth, the demon. So what do you think? Abaddon could be. It's a good, good thought. Good reflection. That's a good reflection. Um, Abaddon is kind of a funny, it, it's funny they use that word here. The word shows up in the Old Testament five times, uh, but three of them are in Job. Abaddon is, uh, sometimes it's personified as a person like we see here, and sometimes it's just a word for the realm of the dead. A word like Sheol is, is a, a realm of the dead for um, ancient Israel. So it's kind of funny to say Abaddon and death. It's kind of like they're saying death and death say. Um, it, I find it kind of a funny word there. But I just thought I would spend a little time uh, thinking about it and 
Go ahead, we have a thought up here. Perish or destroy. Yeah, that Abad. Yes. And so Abaddon would be the, the realm of the destroyed. Yes. Very good. Let's see what we have next here. Um, this is my funny title for the chapter 28. Oh, wisdom, where art thou? Um, it kind of seems like that's what another way Job could be saying. Um, where then is the place of wisdom? Where is the place of understanding? Here's a quote I found from someone, a, a scholar, thinking about chapter 28. He called it, this is a guy named Habel, uh, or Hobble. He calls it a brilliant but embarrassing poem. Why do you think he would say it's a brilliant, after, now that we've talked about it a little bit, now that you have it in front of you, you're looking at it, maybe you read ahead. What do you think he means when he's saying uh, chapter 28 is a brilliant but embarrassing poem? Got nothing? Ooh, okay. So, so it's embarrassing in that way. So they're trying to... Okay. So, that, so it's brilliant in that it's trying to take on this big thing, but embarrassing in that they know they're not going to find it. I like that. Others? Mm, the vulnerability of it's embarrassing. Gotcha. That's great. Let me give you uh, Hobble's uh, reasoning for this. He says it's brilliant and embarrassing because of the breadth of the literature this poem seems to cover, which I think uh, highlights what you both said, how, how it's uh, such a complicated thing, uh, while also having the effect of both impressing and perplexing scholars um, throughout the ages. Um, it's had this, this dual effect of both impressing people and perplexing people. Would anyone describe their, their relationship with this chapter that way now? Would someone describe it a different way? Are you more embarrassed by it or impressed by its brilliance? Perplexed? I think it's I think it's both personally. I, I just thought it would be an interesting question for us to talk about a little bit. Um, one thing people have wondered is, what is it doing here? When we look ahead to twenty nine, it'll look like it's all twenty nine should be right after twenty seven, chapter twenty seven, which Richard finished on last week. It, it looks like it's picking up right where twenty seven left off, but we have this thing in the middle, this weird poem on wisdom that's. Brilliant and embarrassing. It's seeking after this complex, uh, unattainable thing that humans can't find. What on earth is it doing there? Oh, wisdom, where art thou? People have come up with a few options, uh, a few ways of, of justifying how, how this chapter functions throughout for the whole book. Um, one is they talk about textual problems. Like I said, it seems to interrupt the direction that 27 takes, um, and then 29 picks up after. It's written in a different style, a different form. Like I said, uh, the speeches are poetic, but they're in kind of a different form than the other speeches, poetically at least. And so some scholars, especially more recent scholars, have tried to say that this is a later addition to the book. This, this chapter was, was kind of pieced in later, um, maybe a few hundred years down the road, maybe even more. Someone was like, I have this great poem I want to throw in here. Or maybe they thought, maybe they thought the dryness of Job speaking for four chapters was too much. They wanted to throw something in there to kind of change the, the pace a little bit, kind of keep readers on their toes. Uh, so that's what some people think. And this is usually the kind of reading I have when I look at biblical texts. You know how, how Richard and I go back and forth uh, complaining about, well, maybe this is a later edition. No, 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 Richard would say, no, it's not. This is all one text. Uh, and he and I bicker back and forth a little bit. I think I'm more willing to take the Richard side 
of this and, and thinking of how 28 does fit in with the rest of the text. And I think we can use some, some dramatic terms and some musical terms for us to think about that. The first one is to think of chapter 28 as a soliloquy. So thinking, uh, think of Job, like Richard often says, think of Job on the stage, being played out in a, in a drama uh, form. Job's speaking to his friends through, uh, and his friends are speaking back through chapters 3 to 27. They're speaking, they're speaking. Chapter 28 comes, he's over here, his friends are over there. Job walks forward towards center stage while his friends take the side exit so the spotlight can come in on him and he can talk freely. Um, in, in drama, I understand, the use of soliloquies is um, used primarily to show a shift in the direction of the story. Um, I understand Shakespeare does this a lot, especially in Hamlet, he does this quite a few times, where the spotlight will go in on one character so they can ponder what their next step is. Does that make sense? So that's, that's one way of thinking about, about this. Job is, has been going back and forth. He's thinking about whether or not he should listen to his friends or uh, listen to his friends repent and try to get back on God's good side or keep pushing, keep demanding a trial with God like we, so like Martin Sheen did in that video clip we watched a couple weeks ago. He's pondering this. And so wisdom would be uh, quite an appealing ideal to think about in this pondering what his next steps might be. Uh, and this would actually be Job's second soliloquy. Do you know what, do you have anyone have a guess? The other one's already happened. Do you have, does anyone have a guess what chapter or what area the first one might be in? You got it. Chapter 3. Uh, Job, Job speaks the entire chapter just like 28. Um, it's, it's Job speaking for 20 some odd verses. Um, and the friends haven't said a word yet. And it, it all is also seems to be in a little different form than the rest of the speeches. Um, so some people have said, 20 is a soliloquy, but it's not just a soliloquy, it's Job's second soliloquy. After Job is cursed, or is afflicted, his, loses his family, is personally afflicted with um, sores all over his body, after his wife tells him to curse God and die, and after his friends sit there in silence with him, he gets the stage for a little bit to think about what direction he wants to go. Now that they've had this conversation with the friends, this is the second chance to see, to, to stop and think about what, um, what's next for me. Where does the story go from here? Uh, another way people have um, thought about this, and my, my professor who I took a Job class with in seminary uses this word, is uh, to think of chapter 28 as a formata. Does anyone know what a formata is? Some musical person, tell us what a formata is. You hold a tone. Is there a reason why you hold the tone? For effect. Okay, I like that. To add emphasis, to add effect. Um, yeah, that's very good. Any other thoughts on what a fermata is? How do you think chapter 28 might be functioning like a fermata in, in music? Of this hold, this pop. Hmm. The whole book of Job. Oh, okay. I like that. Why would you? Why would you do that? As an overture. Are you, are you willing to posit that? Yeah, okay. okay. So, so this, would you posit that this is a later edition? Would you take that dangerous road? Okay. <laughs> that, that's great. That's great. Suspends it. Okay.
Very good. I, I like that. It, it, Fermata break musical rules, too. They hold a beat longer than the, the written music tells them to, which I think is an interesting way of thinking about this poem on wisdom where, where Job is contemplating a number of things. I saw this hand first, and we'll go back up. Yes, and a soliloquy would certainly show that too. Um, that the next, whatever happens next, is important. It, it's an important um, placing in the plot of the story. Very good. Yes. Mm -hmm. mm. That's a that's a great way of thinking about chapter twenty eight. I think. And let's move on so we can see how that how the how the rhythm of Job resumes in, in 29 to 31. Um, but wait first, I got ahead of myself a little bit. <laughs> let's pause for a little bit. Let's, let's do our own fermata for the class. 28's done. Job is asked, where, where can wisdom be found? Job has also thought about um, what his next steps are. So what other options does he have? I think there are really two options he has. Does he agree with his friend's theology of retribution, with the speeches that bad things do indeed happen to good people? As we saw at the end of 28, where he says the fear of the Lord is um, wisdom and to depart from evil is understanding, uh, I think that's a little bit of a nod to, to him thinking about agreeing with his friends here. Or, so does he do that, or does he do this? Does he agree with his wife in chapter 2, in the prologue that we talked about so long ago? Does he agree with his wife in her plea for Job to curse God and die? This is, I think this is what Job is pondering here. Which, which camp, which, which political party do I uh, align myself with here, uh, Job is, is saying. Which, do I put on a red cap or a blue cap? Um, that's one way you could think about it. And I think the wisdom interlude that we've just spent some time on has a nod to both of these. Um, any other options you can think, can you think of? Those are the only two I could think of. Yes, Nick? Sure, that's, that's a great comment. And remember that comment when we get to uh, God speaking to Job in the whirlwind and Job's quick response to, to what God says to him. Keep that in mind when we get there. I think you'll be, uh, you'll be delighted with what you said <laughs> just now. Or, or maybe troubled, we'll see. Suffering in silence, suffer, or maybe continuing to complain about it like he has been for 20-some chapters. Well, let's look ahead and see what Job does. This is uh, kind of a, this is on your handout as well. This is just a rough outline of the next few chapters. Chapter 29, Job kind of talks about his past blessings. He, he uh, reminisces on, on the good old days when he um, was this great, great man in his community, he did all these good things for people. Um, and then when he gets to chapter 30, he says, well, why am I still in misery? Why am I still saddened by this? You can see um, for chapter 29, he says, um, verse 4, When I was in my prime, when the friendship of God was upon my tent. Remember when we had the friendship lesson, I talked about different words throughout the Old Testament, particularly throughout Job for friendship. This is the one that said, men of my counsel. Uh, so here in verse 4, Job is reminiscing on a time when God was a man of his counsel. Um, God was someone who looked over his tent and was an advisor to him. He's reminiscing and lamenting the loss of those old days. And so we keep going in 30, like I said, Job's present misery. We have a, a 
short clip in the handout here. Um, I'll just read you verse 1. But now they make sport of me, those who are younger than I, whose fathers I would have disdained to set with the dogs of my flock. That's a really powerful verse. <laughs> so people are making fun of him, whose own fathers he wouldn't have even wanted to take care of his dogs uh, before. So Job is really putting the exclamation point on his current state of misery here. So this seems to be kind of getting away from where he is going in the, the wisdom text, right? Seems that way to me. Anyone want to disagree? Okay. Um, and so we get to 31. This is the, um, at the end of 31, it says the words of Job are ended, which they're not. But we can uh, talk more about why that's significant later, that the words really aren't ended. But we're supposed to assume that 31's his last speech, and Job kind of has these oaths that he, that he talks about. He gives five oaths that he says, if I've ever done this, then God, it's okay that you have done this to me. If I've ever done this, it's okay that you've done this to me. Uh, but then in the middle of it, we have this weird, um, th these weird two verses that I gave you, verses 35 to 37, where these oaths are interrupted. This is after like the third oath, I think where he says, Oh, that I had one to hear me. Here is my signature. Let the Almighty answer me. Oh, that I had the indictment written by my adversary. Surely I would carry it on my shoulder. I would bind it on me like a crown. I would give him an account of all my steps. Like a prince, I would approach him. Which option do you think Job is leaning towards there? Agreeing with his friends and repenting? Uh, Agreeing with their theology of retribution, of bad things happening to uh, bad people? Or is he taking the option of his wife, of being willing to call, call God to account for what's happened? So you, so you see this as answering something back in um, chapter in the 20s. Yeah, okay, okay, I like that. That's, that's a good way of thinking about it. So, so instead of him talking to God, so his friends come back up on stage for, for 29, like we're talking about the drama of Job. His friends are back on stage. Instead of looking up, talking to God, he's looking over there at Zophar and talking to him in 31. Well, that's a good interpretation. I like that. Other thoughts? Someone else kind of said a, a yeah when you were... When you uh, you're saying that, Brad? Let the Almighty answer me, he says. Yeah. Um, so you think he's talking to God, but you think he's doing it not on a calling God to account, but just wanting that that meeting of God, that fellowship with God. Is that what I'm hearing there? Yeah, yeah, so um, a more positive uh, hope for meeting God. Do um, you, you see the courtroom language in here? Indictment, adversary, account of all my steps, like a litigation. Um, there's a lot of courtroom language. Th this is why people have taken that kind of negative. I want to call God to trial. I want to call God to account. Um, so a lot of people have read this to be like Martin Sheen in the, the West Wing clip we watched a couple of weeks ago. Um, cursing God, calling God out. Um, but Nick, I, I think you bring up a good um, counter that he is talking to God, but maybe it's, it's a little more positive than we're reading into it. Yeah. 
Yeah, if you look at the oaths, uh, I'm sorry I didn't put those in our uh, handout, but if you see the oath, um, he's like, yeah, I mean, he's so confident that he's never done these things, um, from, from treating the poor badly to um, um, having lustful thoughts. Uh, so if I've done these things, then my suffering's justified, but I haven't, so it's not. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, well, you can certainly see in chapter twenty-nine when he talks about God being uh, one of my men of counsel, someone who looked over my tent. Um, you certainly think he has that that knowledge of God at least in his former blessed life. Um, but like Richard would say a lot in the in these classes that. We, the readers, have more knowledge than Job does throughout the whole thing. Job doesn't have the, have the knowledge of the divine counsel where Satan is sent by God to, to cast these afflictions on Job. Um, Job is not privy to that information, but we are. So we're in kind of a weird place of um, knowing more than the main character knows. Um, that's often seen in drama. That's a good, good reflection. When we get to chapter 42, verse 6, I think you'll be very pleased with, <laughs> with what you've said there because that, that's how many people have interpreted Job's words there. Th those are really Job's last words, not in 31 here. But let's keep going. We have some more Brick Testament. I promised you I'd send you more of these. Uh, if you had to guess, chapter 29, 30, or 31, which uh, chapters does this come from? 30? Why would you get 30? So you see, um, look at your outline. We have past blessings in 29, present misery in 30, and 31, Job's kind of oaths and final declaration of innocence. 31, other guesses? I must not have outlined this very well. It comes from chapter 29. He's talking about um, his blessed life where he did these, uh, where, he, where he had this good relationship with God. He was this great person in his community. Um, so he's, you see his friends are, are there. He, they're standing over him. He's lying down. and That's his ash heap, his little, uh, little pile of Legos there. Let's try one more. This one's easier because it's on your sheet. Which chapter does this one come from? 31? Yeah, yeah, this is kind of Job's, uh, what I would say, indictment of God. Uh, Nick would say uh, calling to, to be in fellowship with God, which is a great, great addition, great uh, alternate reading. Um, so I just want to show you a couple of these. This is how one uh, interpretive um, group has, has looked at these chapters. Job is kind of upset there, <laughs> if you can look at his face. And, and same there as well. He has that kind of grumpy... Uh, agonizing face. He still has all of his sores on him, too, and he's turned this weird green color. But I'm sure we'll have more, especially when we get to the whirlwind of, of the Brick Testament, so hold tight. But let's, let's look real quick at elements, because we want to do one more thing before we uh, break for the day. So, we get to these chapters, and like I said before, 29 seems to pick up right where 27 left off, making 28 kind of an awkward break, but we've, we've kind of reconciled that. Um, 
this little section, Job's kind of last speeches, last, uh, his last hurrah, if you will, it ends with us um, expecting something. Now, don't look at that. What would you expect um, to happen next after, after this chapter? Don't, don't look at my answer, though. Tell me if you have a different one. He wants answers, um, is how I would say. He's, he, wants, um, he wants justification. I, I'm, I'm sure he's also uh, just seeking his past life where nothing was wrong. He was in great relationship with God, with his family, his community. Um, yes. Yes, you got it. Um, it's the whole, the theme of Someone suffering for no reason, which is a quote from, from Job. Um, and that's what we've been thinking about this entire book, is why is suff someone suffering for no reason? Um, very good. So what do we expect to happen next? Do we expect seven more chapters of speeches like we get? <laughs> after after this, these words I gave you from chapter 31, these verses, you expect God to show up, right? You, you're, you're excited, you're pumped up for this encounter, but no, we have seven more chapters. Because <laughs> this guy, Elihu, shows up, who we'll talk about next week. Oh, interesting, very interesting. Thanks for that comment. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about whether or not Elihu's worth keeping in there or not next week. That's, well, that'll be a, a fun uh, piece of evidence. Um, and so the last verse of chapter 31, we see that the words of Job are ended. But they're not really ended because he talks in the whirlwind. So just keep that in mind as we go forward. Um, now, I'm going to ask my wife here to put on a movie clip. Um, I'm going to talk about it for a minute first because she'll get it loaded up. This is from a movie called The Tree of Life. Has anyone seen this movie before? Um, it, it has a lot of Job elements to it. And uh, this is, I think this is a very interesting, kind of enigmatic clip of it. Um, the very first words you see when the movie starts are the very first words of the whirlwind. Where were you when I created the foundations of the earth? Um, so there's definite Job uh, ties in this movie. And the clip I'm going to show you is kind of uh, a hodgepodge of, of experiences of this, this man who's reflecting on his childhood and his uh, relationship with his father. His mother and his father, he, he kind of sees as representing grace and nature. His mother represents grace. His father represents nature, kind of that tough love, uh, fatherly types that people who grew up in the, the late 50s, early 60s might know. Um, and the scene right before this is the grace part, showing his relationship with his mother. Um, the very first scene you'll see is his father waking him up. His mother, when she wakes him up in the previous scene, is very playful, very fun. But his father is more, uh, all right, time to go. Um, but you'll see a lot of things. You'll see his father um, really thinking about his former blessings in his life. He, he hoped to be this great musician. Um, and you see him kind of talking about how that didn't work out. You see him, uh, and that, that reminds us of 29, right? Former blessings. Um, we'll talk about his kind of bitter worldview a little bit. We'll see that a little bit. Um, you'll just kind of see this conflicted person throughout. But uh, another part of the scene is uh, the family going to church. And the sermon about the preacher that day is on Job, believe it or not. And this really reminds me of chapter 30, where it's kind of talking about the fragility of humanity, um, kind of how man is uh, someone who suffers a lot. So I don't want to tell you any more because I want you to come up with your own ideas from the clips. Very good. Um, yeah, well, we are over time, unless there's anyone dying to have another comment, comment in. I'll, I'll close this with prayer. But thank you all for your reflections, and, and thank you all for helping me uh, interpret and reflect on, on these uh, 
four very dense chapters. Let us pray. O heavenly God, keeper of all wisdom, we thank you for your word which gives us life, which gives us hope, and which gives us peace. Continue to inspire us as we reflect and ponder these words throughout our week. May they be sources of comfort and discomfort alike, and may they always bring us ever closer to you. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Thank you all. See you next week where we talk about Elihu.